Good morning, church. How are y'all doing? Well, we we got in at about 10 last night, roughly, and uh, we had two days of relaxing uh, vacation over in East Texas. And just a, a lot of fun times, wasn't it, Doug? We're, we had cleaned up fairly decently, so we got them all ready for that. It, we had a good trip. I'll give a little report on that later, uh, and then I'm going to put a full report out on Facebook uh, Live and put it out in, on the church website so people can kind of see what we did and who we helped and, and that thing. But we had a, a good trip. Everybody returned with all their fingers and toes. Uh, no, no, nobody's too sore. Uh, I don't know about them. I am. But uh, and, uh, I, I'm not wearing work boots today. No steel toed boots. So I'm, I'm happy today. Y'all happy? Amen. I did learn one thing from this. I prefer wind damage to flood damage. Amen. <laughs> and one of the little ladies we were working on our house, I think it was two storms before, the one before Harvey uh, hit. We did a little job and said, oh yeah, we're going to do a little job. That means you don't know if you're coming up on an 80 foot tree or what, but she had just a little cedar tree down. And we were talking to her and we talked about her house. And I said, well, this is the second one I've had on this property that got rebuilt. Uh, three years ago after the other one wiped it out and then we got some water and again and on this one So I'm, I'm just blessed. I have this one little tree a little widow lady that we just just one little tree down So I'm, I'm, I'm blessed that we're not having to deal with all that. She said God gave me another day I'm happy yeah. and that's us too. Just gave us another day and we're happy We can be here to to worship and, and uh, serve him today. So glad y'all are here and I'll talk a minute about that Oh, okay. We had a change in correction here, so we have to do this. So let's all stand up. Let's sing it. Uh, what a friend we have in Jesus. So. Jesus 
where her bed was and everything. And it, it landed on that, that trailer across there. And with the excavator, they were able to cut out big chunks of limb and move them out and, and do different things like that. They stayed on that. We worked with them a little, moving some stuff around. And then we went to another job because heck, you couldn't keep up with Aaron. And then we were standing around, except with the tractor. And, uh, and he gets extra credit because he said we gave him all the good jobs <laughs> on his birthday. And then that night we were going out to eat and we got, we left another job. Somebody said, just meet us. We're going to Tia Juanita's Fish House in Beaumont. And Doug's comment was, what, Doug? We're driving what? 25 miles Yeah, we're driving 25 miles from Mexican food. And we said, yeah, we are. And so <laughs> we went over and it was worth it. It was a good, good trip over there. And about halfway over there, Warren said, where's Aaron? And we went, I don't know. So we called him and he had already taken a shower. He had eaten some stuff and I think they were in bed by eight. We didn't get home till like 8.45. He said, I, we were gonna thinking about driving over there. I said, no, we ain't gonna make it. So they get extra credit for being left out and <laughs> took, you know, abused and everything. And the next day they drove down to Lake Charles and uh, came back to uh, deliver some uh, stuff to a ministry over there, came back and Gave them another good job to work on. So uh, they took care of it, and they're young and healthy and can do that. So uh, this we worked at all kind of different houses. Like I say, I'll give a more re, uh, report on all the different things. What impressed me the most was First Baptist Church of Orange who hosted us. They said, oh, yeah, we got power. Well, we drove up. They had a gen set, about a 500K uh, gen set sitting there to run their whole building. Their building had flooded during the storm. It ripped, the, it didn't tear the building off, it just blew it through the walls and it ripped off their air conditioner things up on the roof, the covers, and the water just poured into that building that's seven years old and ruined <laughs> that building. And where we were sleeping, it blew water through and they cleaned out the carpet in one of those rooms and did that. And, and they still invited us to come in. Most churches would say, y'all just go find some somewhere else. We have to take it, but they had their own crew there working on their church. I was very impressed by that. Also Dale's church, Dale Lee's church, uh, Orange County Cowboy Church, yeah, they, you have to think on that. They were supposed to move in to their new youth build, not, I mean children's and youth building the Friday that the storm hit, the Sunday that, was, that they were out. And they sustained roof damage and they had painted murals and stuff all over the children's wing and had all that stuff done. And so they had a lot of damage that was done on their church. And they were out taking care of everybody else before they would take care of their own. So that's, that's the kind of people you're working with over there. And, and, and uh, I was very impressed. And Dale did say hi. And uh, John Bickner at, at uh, First Baptist Orange said hi. Now we, we learned one thing, that in Orange, we never saw an orange over there. <laughs> Never saw one. And if you put in First Baptist Church of Orange, you're likely to go to First Baptist Church of Orange Field. Uh, we were driving, we were coming back because we were running off GPS, we weren't running off maps. And, and, and we, somebody put it in and says, okay, how do we get back to where we're supposed to be? And put it in. We drove up, and our church wasn't there. It was a different church. There's Orange Field. And then you have West Orange. You have all these different things. So we were looking at all these different areas and around what we have. In total, we had about 16 guys working uh, and had one lady that showed up. We didn't know they were, had a place for them to sleep, but they did. So I had one from uh, West Oaks came over to work with us. But uh, we had a, a myriad of jobs, had a good time doing it, had good fellowship. Uh, like I say, God provided safety for us during all this, this time. Uh, Provided some pretty good food for us. And they said, well, they'll cook in their kitchen. Well, their kitchen was wiped out. <laughs> I mean, so they didn't have a place to do that. Their whole facility was. And so uh, so we, we got to eat some sandwiches and had a real good holy pancake Waffle House breakfast yesterday. That was a good thing. Uh, can't beat Waffle House, you know. So that gave us strength for the day to go through all that. And, uh, drank a lot of Gatorade. We gave away the funds that we gave, I think we had somewhere right around $4,200 that came in. 
and uh, were able to share that with three different, with the two churches and a ministry, so they could reach out and touch other people with that. And I kind of felt like Oprah. You get money. You get money. <laughs> kind, of, kind of good. But thank y'all for your generosity and and, uh, and and your prayers for for our trip and for our safety and what all we did. So much to do. We could have stayed on one street and been there for the next month, I think. But we'd go from one job over to another and we'd meet different people and just offer them a little blessing in the Lord just by being laborers for him and his his kingdom. And, and the people that we worked on for the most part were Christian folks. Most of them had a really good attitude. All of them did have a good attitude. Well, I'm here. I'm alive. If stuff's torn up, then I'm okay, you know. And uh, that's a that's a good attitude, attitude to have. We had that, you know, a couple of years ago. Had to go through that same thing here, just but with floods instead of wind. And God provided for us in so many different ways here. We're just blessed to be here. And I'm glad you all are here this morning to worship with us. We're going to continue to sing. Liz is going to read a psalm. And then we're going to continue to sing. And I'll get more of a full report out on this uh, with some details on the pictures Facebook either today or tomorrow sometime this week I don't know when I wake up and yes I'm gonna get a nap this afternoon so mm -hmm. okay I'm gonna read uh, from some verses from Psalm 113 and then finish with Isaiah 12 2 praise the Lord praise the Lord you his servants praise the name of the Lord let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation.
and when I reach the final day, He will not leave me in the grave, but I will rise, He will call me home, the Lord is my salvation. That's a good one to swap back to and just kind of puts everything in perspective. Book of John kind of puts the whole gospel story, lays it out there. Romans lays out a lot of our theology that we uh, take that Paul wrote. We have so many different ways that we can read and study the scriptures today. Probably more today than we ever have had the opportunity to in the history of man. You can go online. You can find different things. You can find web webinars. You can find podcasts. You can even find a book. Amazing <laughs> that you know, have a real book that has pages and stuff that you turn. I even have an app on here that I can turn it and it flips like a book. I flip it back over. Just so, you know, we have so many opportunities to learn about God, and it was refreshing to be around folks who were going through suffering like we've gone through, pain like we've hit over here. First Baptist Orange, they're in a search for a pastor. They've been in search for a pastor for a little over a year. The pastor was going to stay up till they found one, and now he says November the 1st because COVID hit and everything else, and had two, I think people <coughs> lost off the committee, some to, to death and some to moving and different things like that. And so they're, they're looking, you know, to, to find this and he said, I've just got to go. But even through that, that church still ministers, just like we do in times of stuff. We, we have a good organization of folks that we can work with. And just they're out there to look for and find and people that are willing to do it. And I'm appreciative of, of everybody that, that went and worked and sweated. Jared Schulke said, well, because Jeff Farley went and Mason came and on Saturday brought their extra chainsaws and they have the big chainsaws 
I got the little battery power one, okay? Tonka one. It works great for me. But you get behind Mason on that thing. Get out of the way, John. He gets that look on his face. Doesn't he, April? See, she knows, you know. Gets that look on his face and gets it. And so give me something to cut. I'm ready to cut something. I'm going to get in there and do it. But Shulky said, said uh, well, I don't know what we're going to do. And he said, what? He says, well, we've got Sweeney's pastor. we got the mayor of Sweeney and a hospital board member all standing here. And Warren walked up to him as I came up and interviewed him like on TV, you know. Like, <laughs> and it's kind of interesting. He says, how are they going to do it? And he says, well, can you and Jeff ride on the same car? You know, the same car. Oh, yeah, we fly in the same plane. It's, it's kind of you know, we had a good time doing what we do with all the, kind of the president and his stuff. But, you know, we need to have a joyful life even in the midst of terrible times, don't we? That's what shows that we're Christians. So we are known by our love that we show for other people. John Berkner said, said I wish they would take out one seminary class of preachers, maybe on hermeneutics or something like that, and just teach them how to love people. How to love people. How to show Jesus' love in all circumstances and all things. I said, that'd be a pretty good idea, but a lot of that comes from experience. You know, it's a hard thing when you go into that. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 11 this morning. Matthew chapter 11, we're going to be uh, starting in verse 16. And going through 19, just a fairly uh, short passage this morning. And Jesus is, in this passage we're going to be reading, he's, he's talking to a crowd in Galilee about John the Baptist. You remember that John was one that was, who was sent from God to call all people to repentance. It wasn't a very popular subject back then, and today it's not really that popular either, is it? And, and he came to call to prepare the way for the Messiah. And Jesus is explaining that John is the new Elijah, the one that prophesied, was prophesying the one to come. But Jesus is frustrated with how John has been received along the way. How he's been received along the way. The way he's been rejected, the way Jesus himself is rejected. And I think you can hear just a little irritation in, in his voice here with the people and their disbel disbelief. Let's, let's look at Matthew 11. Verse 16 and following. He said, To what can I compare this generation? They're like children sitting in the marketplace, calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. And the Son of Man, Jesus talking about himself, came eating and drinking, and they say, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is, was proved, but wisdom is proved right by, his, by her deeds. Jesus is saying, I don't even know what to think about you people. He's basically saying, what's wrong with you people? Any of y'all had a teenager that you ever had to say that to? What were you thinking? My mother asked me that a lot. And I said, I wasn't. And she said, I know. That just goes along with it. Jesus was saying, telling these people, you're acting like little kids. You're acting like babies. And Jesus used an example to them. You know, children play make-believe. They act out things. Well, we have our little girls with us. Like the little semi-twins that we have. We can hear them playing. We can hear them making up stories and doing this. And, Hazel, and Audrey will get mad and says, she won't me, let me make up anything. She wants to make, oh, Hazel wants to make up everything. I have to, and we said, okay, Hazel, you let Audrey make up some of the story too, you know? And it goes back and forth like that. You know, kids, when they have, they play house, they play store, they play uh, church sometimes. I've heard of some experiences of kids playing church and trying to baptize a cat. It didn't work out well for them. You know? but, but they'll do that. 
And sometimes the playmates don't get along with each other. I know Jackson's when they have their herd over at the house. All of it. she's a she's like the saint of all grandparents because she can have all of them at the house at the same time. And Buddy's got a racetrack; he can put them on and let them run around out there and fire some steam off or whatever. But I guarantee you they get in little arguments every now and then, don't they? And they you have to balance all kind of different things. You know, here Jesus is saying these kids who are, are like the kids who re refuse to play wedding, not dancing to the flute music, or a funeral, not pretending to be the professional mourners that wailed and cried along with the family. They would hire extra people to come in and wail and mourn more of what happened. In other words, their friends play, they, they didn't like it. They refused to go along with it. They don't want to go with the happy game of wedding. They don't want to participate in the play funeral. They can't be pleased either way. Sounds confusing to us, but what, so what's Jesus talking about here? Children's games? But let's look at verses 18 and 19. It says, For John came neither eating or drinking, they say, and he has a demon, and the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say he's a glutton, he's a drunkard, he's a friend of tax collectors, and and he's a friend of sinners. Well, who are sinners, folks? That's everybody. We're all sinners. And John the Baptist was known for being a little edgy, wasn't he? He didn't paint over, he didn't give a nice picture to what all was happening in Pollyanna in any way. He kind of called it like it was. And a lot of times he stayed out in the desert by himself. He was alone. The scripture says that for for his meals, he ate what he could find. He had locust and he ate honey and whatever else he could find out there to scrounge on out in the, uh, in the desert. Whatever the normal diet of the desert was, he ate it. And I'm pretty sure he looked just about like Doug and I and Mason. Billy looked after about an errand, after being out in that sun, covered in dust, covered in dirt, sweaty. I'm surprised Lisa let me put my overalls in the washing machine. <laughs> But he looked like that. He's his un unkept, he's got a beard, long hair. Probably sounded like a maniac when he came out to preach, but there was truth in every word that came out of his lips. And John, Apostle John, re records that the Jews sent the religious people out to question him, and they could have just ignored him and hoped he'd go away. But there was something about his message they couldn't ignore. However, in the end, they decided he was too dangerous for their traditions and their authority. Now, there's two things that we get into today, even traditions and authority. And they, also in Jesus, they, they didn't like, they was messing with that, but also him saying that he was the Messiah that was coming. They weren't ready to accept that. I think Rhonda Poston said when she was teaching, she said, some kids just weren't ready to learn. They weren't prepared to, their mind wasn't ready to learn what they had to teach that day. And by the way, Alyssa, if you want to talk to her about homeschooling and apps and stuff, she tried to do that with Lucas the other day, Friday. She said, I feel sorry for those folks. I don't know how the little kids are doing it. She said, I'm fairly smart. I don't have trouble with all this stuff. And so, they just, they just missed him as having a demon. After all, he had that, Jesus had a simple life. He designed, denied himself and, and he designed, denied the pleasures of this earth. And him and John both really didn't fit into what they thought was coming. They were looking for a white horse and a sword. They were looking for somebody to take over the Romans, get them out of the way. And the Jews were. And then, Jesus comes himself after John and he was that friend of the tax collectors who were dishonest and he was friends of sinners of all kinds. He went to their weddings and dinner parties. He enjoyed the good things of life. 
And so feeling really threatened by his message that he was the sign of the re religious leaders labeled him as a glutton and a drunkard. You know, I'm glad today that we don't label people as certain things. Aren't y'all? You look in the political world today and some people can't do anything right. Some people can't do anything wrong. You're going, are we watching the same TV show? Are we watching the same thing? What? And this is what was happening back then. You know, now you can kind of get the connection with the cranky kids who re refused to play with each other no matter what the friend suggested. If they didn't like you, if their power was threatened, the Pharisees and the other leaders just tried to discredit you of all your teachings. You can just hear him saying that. Saying John the Baptist must be crazy or evil. He looks so weird. He just deprives himself of any pleasure. And then Jesus, oh, he's just a good for nothing. We're just going to discredit him. He's just a partier. Look at who he hangs out with. Hangs out with sinners. You know, if our behavior is countercultural, if we're not doing what the world says is proper at the time, then we're going to be unpopular. And yet a lot of times we try to be popular and do whatever the world wants us to do, don't we? We dilute the gospel. We dilute the gospel of Christ. The world hates folks that follow Jesus. And they like to make fun of Christians. But folks, that's not a surprise. Because Jesus told us they were going to do that, didn't he? It's in this life you're going to have troubles. You're going to have tribulations. You're going to have these problems. And they were going, well, not me. We're going to do it this other way or whatever. Well, see how that, where that gets us or whatever, you know. You know, John the Baptist and Jesus were teaching two parts of the same message, I believe, in this, this context. First, John was teaching about repentance and and his lifestyle showed it. And that's the solemn and serious part of the good news, as we've been uh, talking about for a long time. And, and because repentance is a necessary part of our relationship to Jesus. Why? Because if we could do it all on our own, if we could take care of it all by ourselves, then we don't need a Savior, do we? I'm guilty sometimes of taking the reins and saying, we need to do this, we need to do that. And sometimes being impulsive, I know none of y'all are like that. But I have to go back and look and say, okay, God, what would you have us do? Where would you have us to be? Who do you want us to talk to? Sometimes those people might be 13 miles from us. Sometimes they might be next door to us. We don't know. We just take them where they have. And we're sinners by nature and our relationship with God is broken when we fail to let him show us where we are failing to hit the bullseye what we're failing to do what we're failing to do right I've kind of found out people don't like criticism y'all ever figured that one out to be I was talking to a, a missions pastor and he said I have I have to I have mentors I have to go to help me every week and they tell me what to do and that's what I'm doing already but they're telling me to do it better but not telling me how to do it he said I'm confused on this stuff it kind of makes you mad people criticize you you know uh, that's just our hu human nature that's our sin nature people come out to do it. You know, I bet you Tommy never had kids get mad at him coaching them did he Tommy no you need to do this. If you want to be a class one player, you need to do this. And I think that's what Jesus is telling us. If we want to be a division one player, if we want to be what he wants us to be, we need to repent. We need to be in line with him in, in all things. When we fail to hit that bullseye, when we sin, then we need to repent from that and get back to it. On the other hand, Jesus was teaching the, he was teaching the joy of forgiveness and the freedom from legalism. Freedom from legalism. People were bound by so many restrictions. They were like prisoners. They were like captives. 
And Jesus said that he came to set us free. He came to release the chains on our lives. We talked about this last week in our sermon. How some of us are bound by chains that other people can't even see. But Jesus is coming to release us from those. And he sets us free with the truth, his truth. And the truth is this, we can never hope to be good enough on our own, can we? The best that we offer is like filthy rags. Because it's impossible to earn our, sal our, our own salvation. It's just impossible to do. And Jesus was teaching about the joy of our salvation. The joy of our salvation. Did he wonder that he hung out with the people who needed him the most? Because of the people that didn't need him the most, who had it all figured out by themselves, wouldn't have anything to do with him, would they? So he hung out with the people who needed to hear it. You know, it's okay to enjoy life. Every person in this room today is blessed. You live in a nice house. You have nice air conditioning. Have an amen for air conditioning? Amen. Thank you, man. I was worried because we almost didn't have it to sleep in. That was going to be messy. Aaron said, you turned it down too cold a room. I said, not too bad. He got up, bumped it up in the middle of the night. But we go through times and, and our joy, our inner joy, should not be affected by outward circumstances coming in. Diagnosis from doctors, maybe a flood coming, maybe windstorm coming. I was blessed this morning because I had that little cold front come through. 68 degrees on my back porch. I said, I like this. I like that. You know, following Jesus it isn't meant to be a sad, miserable existence. Puritans tried that. Tried to do everything to make themselves as miserable as they could. Our inner joy is not affected by our outward circumstances. Verse 19 says, But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. The truth of both repentance and joy are demonstrated by those who live them, who live out those things. And that means us. When people think of the church, when they think of First Baptist Church, they just be thinking of a smiling face, a helping hand, not someone judging them or putting them down. You know, we've had people say, well, I would come to church, but y'all dress too nice up there. I scratch my head on that one. I said, have you been to church? Well, about 30 years ago. <laughs> well, come again and try, give us another shot at this thing. We might have to be wearing Hawaiian shirts on Sunday morning. We, you know, it's okay. We might have to be wearing shorts. Well, okay. We don't have to answer every criticism. Folks on Facebook, when you're looking through Facebook or emails and you get a criticism, you don't have to hit the send button right then. Why not? Because if you do, you're going to say the wrong thing. And there's not a resend button on those, is it? We, have to, we don't have to answer every criticism. We don't have to do these things. What we need to do is just live consistent, obedient lives that with time are shown out what you live. I look at Dale Lee. And I was, you know, it's been 19 years since he left this church and went over back to East Texas to minister. 19 years. To me, that's like that. I was going to say, what was that, five, six years ago? 19. I went, really? But you look at his life of ministry and see how he's doing and what he's done. It's the same thing. I remember when Dale came to this church. He didn't know anybody. He took a church directory. He cut it up in little pieces. I said, what are you doing? He made flashcards. And he memorized everybody's name and address and probably phone number because that's what he did for about two hours every day, just memorize that. So when he would see you, he could call you by name. Might be good to look through our church directory and see who we're not seeing here. Give him a call if you say, I haven't seen this person in a long time. Give him a call. You know, that wisdom of the truth is proven outright. We like to 
dog down on the Pharisees and criticize them. Those other people during Jesus' time, they just didn't get it. And Jesus was right there with them. But don't we have doubts today too? Yeah, we do. You know, it's hard to accept and follow the, the lifestyle of Jesus. And some of us like the idea, and some like the idea of tradition and rules so they don't have to make decisions about what to do. It says this, do this, do that. I kind of prefer the idea of grace. Of grace, free given by Jesus for our lives to reach out and touch other people. Where would we be without God's amazing grace in our lives? What would we be like? What would it be like if God took his hand totally off and said, okay, do it yourself? What would it be like? Not good. You know, Jesus taught freedom, but he made it clear that he didn't come to abolish the law. One of our Baptist distinctives is soul competency. In other words, each follower of Jesus has the ability to make spirit-led decisions regarding their faith and their practice. You know, when each one of us turns to God in true repentance, not just feeling sorry for what we did, but turning away from it and going with Him, that leads us to a life of obedience. It helps us to make decisions with the Holy Spirit making those calls for us. The opposite side of that coin is, is to have trust that God's working and leading in the lives of other Christians around us. Even other churches around us. I was listening to a thing by Mark Lowry, uh, Gaither Vocal Band. He's a comedian, preacher. He was talking about how he, how his life uh, that he lived pre, just understanding how God worked in all different denominations. He says, says that I was somewhere and it just hit me. That there are Christians other than Baptists walking around this earth. He said, I met Pentecostal Christians. I met Nazarene Christians. I met Church of Christ Christians. I met Catholic Christians. He said, that freaked me out. He said, but I, I met them all. And I saw they were all doing God's work. They just weren't doing it the way I thought it needed to be done. We learned that in Sweeney United working with all the church. I miss Sweeney United this year. First time in like 18 years we hadn't done, done that. I missed that. That's hit me hard. This past week I was kind of mully grub during the first part of the week. I didn't like some stuff that happened on world stuff. And then I was also kind of mad because we were supposed to be in Nashville, Tennessee for a scene conference for the Grand Ole Opry, Opryland Hotel where you get lost just going to the bathroom because it's so big. To go get filled up and, and listen to what God had to say through the preachers and through the singing and everything. And that got canceled out. We got to watch it on TV, though. We watched it on TV. But it's just not the same as being there. It's just not the same as sitting in a room with 15,000 other people singing praises to God in one unison voice. I'm looking so far to the day when we take all this tape down we can get back together or we can hug people or we can shake their hands or we can have a greeting time or we can love and check on other people. The first job that we did, Doug and our little crew did, Doug and I and Warren and Billy Ray, they said, yeah, this guy's got a little tree down in his front yard. And we went to his front yard he did have a little tree down, a lot of little tree. And we were cutting it up, and he was—he had already moved a big stack by the road by himself. And he was a younger man, but he was full-figured, kind of healthy boy. And he moved it up, and he said, man, I'm tired. He said, I'm so glad y'all are here to help. And we got it all stacked up, and dug him, got his tractor, and picked all these limbs up and put them in the ditch by the road. And that guy was a big old guy about crying. He said, I need a hug. So we shared a big old sweaty hug. If I get COVID, so be it. 
And he was going, I, you, you don't know what this did for me. Y'all could have helped me in a little way. He said, where are you from? We told him. He said, what? <laughs> where is that? And I told him, I said, well, if you look, find Freeport on the map and look about a half inch up on the Texas map, that's about where we're at. He went, oh, okay. But sometimes we need that hub. Sometimes we need that love, don't we? All the people we work for were like that. They needed that same touch. You know, as followers of Jesus, we need to realize that we're going to be criticized in this world. And if we go out and work in the arts and we do stuff that people call us do-gooders, I'll take that as a blessing. So I'd, rather be, I'd rather be doing good than doing bad, wouldn't y'all? And Jesus told us that plainly. You know, when we go against these norms, against this society, we get criticism. We need to say, thank you, Lord. May God touch them. May he see them. May he give them a touch of his spirit to show how he is taking care of them and has been through grace. And we also need to be careful about refusing to work with other believers because they do things a little differently than we do. This could be other denominations. That could be people in our own church. Or some might choose to live simple lives without all the stuff that our society values. And the temptation there that would be feel that others are are living a life if they're not living like that, then they're living a, a life of waste or excess. And then, you know, so many temptations to be stuffy or judgmental toward other people. And we just need to be showing love. You know, Jesus, I think, is, and I believe that he's more concerned with unity in his church more than about anything else. He's also concerned that we are all are doing things in love to help our other, our neighbors and our family and others around us. Sometimes our family is the hardest one to help. You know, Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, 1 through 3, said, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Here's a hard one. He says to be patient, bearing with one another in love making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That's our job. That's our job, isn't it? To do those things that Paul was teaching us in there. Thank you all for coming this morning, being with us. And our television folks, good to see you out there. I'll take these off. I don't have to read anymore. I made my, made my font too small this morning. Oh, well. <laughs> But if you don't know what I'm talking about, the love of Jesus, the love of Christ, what it means to be a Christ follower, what it means to be joyful in times of tribulation, what it, what it means to live out a Christ-like life, what it means to have, I'm here to talk to you. You can call me. You come by the office. We're open. Back again. Come up here and chat with me. By the way, I did give the whole staff off tomorrow. In the bank, too. Well, it is Labor Day, anyhow. Never mind. So, post office, yeah. Don't, don't expect mail tomorrow. Listen, don't go out there and say, where's my mail? You know, it's not coming tomorrow. But let's be joyous in all things. Let's live this Christian life. Let's share with our neighbors. Let's understand to the best of our ability what's, what's going on. Again, I thank you all for the gifts that you gave us to take and distribute. For people that gave money just to buy our lunches and stuff like that. So don't use this for them. This is for y'all. Use it for buying lunches and things like that as you need. Even for people for loaning us cots. Never, that's the biggest cot I've ever slept on in my life. It took Doug and I, what, 30 minutes to figure that one out, put it together? 30 minutes to take it back down? Twin fitted sheep will not fit on that thing. That's a big cot, but thank y'all for loaning us those for, so we didn't have to sleep on the floor that night for that one whole night. A little inconvenience in life brings a lot of blessings.
I think we blessed a number of families and set a good example for Jesus Christ as we were down there doing their working as y'all were here praying for us. But it takes us all. It takes us all. There'll be a time when I can't do this anymore. I think when I'm about 95, somewhere in there. Billy good at 84, I think I can hang in there till 95, you know. And while I can, I will. If we have people we can help, I'll be there. And y'all aren't the same thing. I you know y'all are falling and helping and supporting in any way we can. We just thank you. Thank you for being who you are, the love that you show here at this church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your grace. Thank you that you were able to use us just to go out and do manual labor to see the, sow the seeds of grace and mercy and love to the people that we uh, were able to work for this week. I pray that you just bless them in their cleanup effort as it's not near over. So much more to do. But Father, I pray that you would just bless the ones that we were able to help because you put them there in our path for us to help them. And give them your love, Lord. Thank you for being with us here this morning through the power of your Holy Spirit. And help us to go out and take these verses to heart, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to not be judgmental, not be too stuffy, but be joyful in everything that you give us and all, all that you've done, either good or bad be joyful through these things. Again, we thank you. Thank you for your blessings. We thank you for, for your grace and your mercy. I pray all this in the power of Jesus Christ, your Son.